do re mi pants The Wrestling Life Hey everybody, it's The Wrestling Life. It is episode 280. It's our Indigenous Peoples Day special. Is that a thing? It's not a thing. All right, well, it's uh, October 10th or October 11th, depending on when you're listening to this, of 2021. I'm Ethan. And I'm Liam. Liam, we have so much to talk about this week. That's right, and so many things we can't talk about right here on the first and the only podcast. First, I want to apologize for making you wait an hour as I overslept. <laughs> it's 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 fine, but allow me to now waste some of your time sure. and, and just say, isn't it kind of weird that it took until like, I don't know, five years ago for everyone to look at the objective, like historical record of Christopher Columbus <laughs> and be like, dude, didn't discover sh-. <laughs> like. <laughs> Like, there were already people here. <laughs> he wasn't even the first white guy to come here. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. Weird that it took, took us, like, you know, a long time to notice. Like, it took several generations of that being, like, just an established, accepted thing in, like, history classes for someone to be like, hang on. <laughs> what, like, what do words mean? Like, the, the word discover has a specific meaning, and that's, he didn't do that at all right it, uh yeah where does uh, amerigo vespucci fall into all of this this is um you know it's been uh been a couple of decades since i read any history about this who <laughs> amerigo vespucci it's called america because america amerigo vespucci found us first ah yes that would make more sense <laughs> well i, I mean <laughs> Right, we don't, we're not called Columbia now, are we? Uh, <laughs> no, but yeah, it's a strange. Uh, it's a strange thing, and also, like, he sailed to Cuba, which yeah. he claimed was India. Yeah, yeah. Like, nothing, nothing about that guy was a success beyond that. Also, you know, he then helped facilitate like selling Native Americans into sex slavery back in England, like, or back in Europe, I should say, like. Bad, bad guy, bad guy, but also more importantly for what the day is supposed to be celebrating. Does it even make sense? He didn't discover anything. All right. Definitely cutting all that out. The WWE draft is now in our uh, rear view window. She calls it the rear view. And we're <laughs> now on the way to the next Saudi blood money show. And I guess we're in a period where everybody's going to be on both shows for a few weeks and then they'll take three weeks off and then talk about the battle for brand supremacy (laughs) as Survivor Series comes back in uh, November. But anyway, so WWE did a draft. They shook things up again. What do you think? Yeah, I, I didn't think there was any like shocking moves like you figured based on the math of it, like, okay, Bianca is getting moved to one show. I guess they swapped Charlotte and Becky, so that's something. Um, But you figured, like, well, uh, SmackDown has more of the, like, four or five women that they actually do stuff with. uh, SmackDown had, like, (laughs) three of them. So it was like, well, we got to even that out a little bit. Yeah. And otherwise, yeah, we just kind of shuffled some a couple of the main events are mostly seemingly kept together like they moved they moved edge and rollins to raw right yep so yeah it it didn't feel like there was anything too shocking it just felt like yeah we're we shuffled things a little bit and in you know six to eight weeks it'll all feel like we've seen uh, they could do because they only use eight people on each show there is in fact that yes uh, King of the Ring and Queen's Crown tournament started. I'm sure they can't call it Queen of the Ring for some for some uh, trademark reason, and so it's called the Queen's Crown tournament. But, um, boy, boys, there's some bad booking. 
boys are some bad booking in WWE. Liv Morgan having a rough a rough week apparently. I mean, she's going she's going to AEW as soon as she can. <laughs> seems that way. It seems that way with uh yeah, I mean, I guess that's what got her in trouble, but there was someone made a note of, "Oh, every time every draft so far, Kevin Owens and Liv Morgan end up on the same show." And Britt Baker retweeted that with like the thinking emoji or something. And then Liv responded to that. And then Liv lost in like 90 seconds to Carmella on SmackDown. So we can do the math. In a match, she was reportedly originally scheduled to win. Right. So, yeah, I mean, as always, the lesson is don't tweet probably. But yeah. also maybe maybe if you don't care, <laughs> as as the show's favorite wrestler, Kevin Mash, once said <laughs> You know, if you're not a mark for yourself, if you don't give an F who beats you, they can't hurt you. Like, so <laughs> she's just following Big Sexy's advice and she's uh, maybe she's already decided she's out the door. Selena Vega won her first match in decades, beating Tony Storm. <laughs> yeah, Tony's a uh, main roster. She's a child of the 80s, Ethan. I don't know if you know this, despite wild. the fact that she's younger than I am. Why? <laughs> Wild child of the 80s. That's right. Sorry. Wild child. Born in 1994. Yes. Uh, y- younger than me. And yet is uh, her gimmick is that like, it's not impossible that like someone that age could be into that like era of pop culture. Right. Like that happens. I mean, but she is right. So, but it's just like, they have to go about the weirdest way of phrasing <laughs> things. Yes. So she's a wild child of the 80s. And uh, yes. and uh, she, <laughs> since she's been up, she's been used like three times and they've changed her gear or she chose to change her gear. And she's lost a couple of times. So doesn't, uh, doesn't seem, seems like maybe the blooms off the rose with, uh, with her call up as well. Just, just really bad booking. <laughs> she's a, all- a license to print money <laughs> and they, they haven't figured this out yet well speaking of i will just i guess we can deviate here into the call-ups i was thinking about this so when vince and uh his son nick made that that trip down <laughs> the performance center yeah um and sort of evaluated the talent that was there then we got the big you know the bunch of releases and then we had everybody doing dark matches who i guess they saw something in and it was like at this point who is left that we're just doing those dark matches that they haven't either called up fired right or have already sort of relegated to you're not really going to be much and so i think the only names left that are just in this limbo or is it odyssey jones and dakota kai are like are like the two uh, i think so yeah. yeah so but they just did a draft where they drafted xia Lee and Aaliyah yeah. and yeah. uh the uh, Swerve Scott's crew and yeah. notably did not even in the like supplemental talking smack section of the draft uh, put Dakota Kai on one of those shows. So future not looking bright for her, uh, her, her time in WWE. No, I saw her wrestle dark match with Xylee uh, when I went to SmackDown uh, the week before the draft. So yeah, not looking good. Not, look- not looking good. She's in the Bronson Reed spot where they called up, called call them up, and did some uh, did some matches, and then decided not to do anything. So. Yeah, I think even a couple of those matches were on like main event, or I think that's the show that's still on, right? Yes, um, I think I think one of the matches you made like technique. I mean, it's not it's not Raw or SmackDown, but they made television. But yeah. Yeah, it doesn't. I would guess that's probably not right. I know, like in Dakota's case, I know she also had like a Twitch channel that she'd probably have to give up if she went up. So maybe that's, you know, a wrinkle to this. Maybe it's not the worst idea, assuming they don't just fire her like they did uh, some of the other some of the other folks. But yeah, it's like it, it is it is strange that it seemed like, okay, we were waiting for the draft and then they drafted everyone except like one or two people drafted or fired, I should say, I guess. <laughs> right. Um, so yeah, that, I guess that's that'll be something to keep an eye on. They're about to have their next earnings report, and that's usually when the firings come is after an earnings report. So yep, you know, yep. 
you know, hopefully I don't, you know, I'm not rooting for it. Hopefully nobody loses their job, but uh, wouldn't be surprised if that's on the horizon once again. You excited for anything in Saudi Arabia? Uh, no, um, <laughs> it's, I, I don't think anything on the the build for the matches they're doing, which are the the three way with Becky, Sasha, and Bianca. I think that's been pretty good. It's been pretty paint by numbers. You know, one of the three people lays out the other two each week. It's nothing revolutionary, but it's pretty good. Uh, the bro- we've talked about it. The Roman Brock thing is as interesting as a feud <laughs> between Roman Reigns and Brock Lesnar <laughs> could be. Right at this point, thanks to the the Paul Heyman intrigue. Right, um, and then you've got Edge, Edge and Rollins. I assume they didn't say that matches on the Saudi show, but I assume they they announced Hell in a Cell for for Edge and Rollins big blow off match. So I assume that's on that show as well. I think yeah, I think it's on the Saudi show. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, that's that's not nothing like I don't, I, don't, I don't think any of the build has been bad at all, but it is that thing. Well, all of these matches are going to be on a house show in front of tens of thousands of disinterested people on a on a <laughs> in a in a big stadium <laughs> for, you know, to do propaganda for a pretty terrible government. So at, at, at like one o'clock on a Thursday afternoon. Right. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> All of these factors make it hard to feel uh, too excited, but I mean, I don't, I don't discount the efforts of anyone involved. I think they're, they're trying to make it feel like a big, important show, but it's just, we all know what's really going on. And (laughs) I think that genie is hard to put back in the bottle. Yeah. AEW big week. Hankman page returned and earned himself a future AEW world title shot. Speaking of putting the genie back in the bottle. Is have we passed the peak with Hangman Page, or can they get him heated up again? Um, so I would have said that maybe they missed the peak because I thought the peak was that show where they did the ten man tag and the play, and they did that awesome entrance, and the place was going ballistic, and then Kenny just beat him, and the crowd died for the rest of the show. <laughs> um, but when he came out, he got a giant reaction, and it felt like a very exciting thing. So. That being said, the show after their next pay-per-view is in his hometown or home state, at least. Yeah. So put the belt on him, man. Like, I don't I know there's a school of thought that is your top programs are Kenny and Danielson, Kenny and Punk, whatever you're going to be doing. And if that's your top program, the top program should have the title in it. And I don't totally disagree with that. But sometimes, as we've talked about before, sometimes the right time is just the right time. And if you're if you're looking at what like long term is for the best for somebody that isn't 40 or 38 years old in your company, that's a homegrown star, he should probably win the belt. And if you want to put it back on Kenny a month or two months later, I don't hate that. But I also don't necessarily believe that. Kenny losing the belt hurts either a program with Danielson or a program with punk. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I would be leery of beating hangman again, if they did that, I feel like I, I understand the school of thought of like, this could be like a Naito thing, but I also, I would argue they missed the peak peak with Naito um, in, in new Japan. When he finally did beat Okada, he had a, you know, another kind of unremarkable reign. And then, <laughs> It was a year too late. <laughs> yeah. So even though you can look at those things, and if you just watch those matches, if you go back now, it's it's a good story. And and I'm not saying that this couldn't be a good story if Hangman loses here and then wins in a year or whatever. I'm not saying that couldn't be a good story, but as far as like for fan investment, for business reasons, for like long term, you know, people being invested in you know, this guy as a, as a baby face, it's like, yeah, I kind of think if you're, if you're having, if you're putting him right back into that title picture, he should probably win the belt. So they are, um, they're going head to head with WWE for a half hour on this coming Friday night. WWE is doing SmackDown on FS1 due to the Major League Baseball playoffs on Fox. And so WWE's most viewed show 
is going to go up against AEW's least viewed show for a half hour, but because AEW will be in more homes, they have a slight edge. So WWE counter programming, they're going commercial free from 10 to 1030. And they announced, of course, this is the match I would also announce because it's my two favorite wrestlers, Becky Lynch and (laughs) Sasha Banks going head to head against AEW man and tony khan tweets like i can't wait to beat your a show it's like dude i think you're gonna lose total viewers and i think you're gonna lose in the demo so i wouldn't be so confident about that but we get a half hour head to head and wwe appears to be picking a fight just to screw with aew (laughs) and uh and i like that yeah i mean this to me i look at him like this is fun yeah like it's fun and i like and it's one of those things where people point out like Oh, you know, Bischoff gave away rate, you know, gave away results and uh, used to, you know, name check Vince McMahon and make fun of him. And they would point out signs in the crowd talking about how Ross sucks. It's like, but that's not the reason WCW lost. They lost because it was a very poorly run company and they lost an enormous amount of money in a yes. single year. And yeah. then the merger, et cetera, et cetera. Like, like, yes, this stuff is fun. If you are in competition, I like I've I've said this before, like, I think it's fun take shots at the other guys now it it makes more sense to take the shots when you have something to fall back on and to (laughs) aew's credit they beat a wwe show head to head for a year straight so it's not this it's (laughs) not the same show obviously and they didn't have two of wwe's top stars wrestling head to head against them every single week so it's not exactly a one-to-one comparison, but yeah, I, I, I'm fine with WWE doing that. I'm kind of surprised the idea of a third hour of SmackDown on FS1 hasn't <sighs> already been floated like as a full-time thing. I'm not, I'm not rooting for that, but I feel like that's an idea that's going to come up, especially if this, if this third or third or, you know, extra half hour does well, I wouldn't be surprised if that's something that's floated um but yeah so i think like i think this could be really fun and and i think my guess is that the the punk match is is leading off di- or rampage on friday night so that's and rampage is live this week so it's like it's that sounds like a really cool environment it's going to be a f- i think it's going to be a fun night and whatever happens it'll like it's going to be fun and i like i like people throwing throwing shade and and saying hey we're better than the other guys i think it's fun like every it's enjoyable to me the thing the thing about it though is that we have a literal almost literal literally almost a generation of fans since since wcw went out of business 20 years 20 plus years now that have never experienced a real wrestling war (laughs) right and have no memory of any of those things that you mentioned um and i i i don't know i yeah it's it's fun it's going to be fun uh unless you have to uh write write wrestling news stories for a website (laughs) (laughs) which will be you'll be looking at your laptop for the whole show instead of uh, looking at the screen but yeah yeah it, it should be good um i know you saw uh gcw show this weekend where John Moxley <laughs> and Nick Gage wrestled? Question <laughs> mark. Uh, what did you think of that show? I mean, I, it dep- Yeah, it depends. Like, uh, I don't. Yeah, I I thought it was a it was a pretty fun show. I think GCW for their big shows, at least. And to be fair, I don't watch every single show they do, but this is my second full GCW show I watched. And I think the thing I'm I'm struck by with both of them is. There is good variety in styles of wrestling on the shows. The opener with was uh, Alex Zane, Leo Rush, and Ninja Mac in like a just a like high flying, fun three way, lots of dives, lots of spots, and they had a tag match with Joey Janela and Marco Stunt against Chris Dickinson and Starboy Charlie. Just two, you know, it's two slightly larger guys versus two little with two little partners. Like it's a very, like that was fun. And then you had a, like kind of a six, like a six man tag that was a little bit more hardcore, but not the same style of hardcore that 
the guys in the main event did. And then there was the big surprise, which was that the GCW tag champs who were involved in that second year crew were confronted by the Briscoe brothers. So that's the real uh, forbidden door, I guess. Right. Because apparently ROH and AEW guys can appear on the same televised or uh, I guess internet pay-per-view shows uh, and nobody gets mad. So that's something. Um, but then, yeah, the, the main event was, uh, was it's, it, it was a spectacle is how I would, uh, is how I would uh, describe it. It was bloody. The, literally the first spot of the match is Nick Gage grabbed a, like a bunch of light tubes tied together and smashed them over John Moxley's head. John Moxley bled immediately. And they continued to throw each other through glass and barbed wire and used, uh, you know, everything, you know, drove each other through panes of glass. Gage took like a back body drop through panes of glass onto a barbed wire board on the outside. Like it was insane. So if like you got your, if you paid to see some violence, you got it. <laughs> um, and then I guess maybe the surprise result was that Moxley just won clean. And then, uh, and then Gage did a little promo afterwards, apologizing to the fans for not getting it done and promising that he's going to win the belt back. So I think they're going to run that back probably at, if I had to guess, would be at the just announced show they're doing the Hammerstein Ballroom on, in January. Um, so I think that's, if I were a betting man, I would say that's the Moxley versus Gage rematch and probably where Gage wins the belt back. So yeah, it, it it continues to feel like a a really hot promotion, and it's a it's a cool, fun vibe. You have a good variety of stuff. You have kind of wackier, more comedic, character driven stuff like that Matt Cardona versus Effie on that show, as well as lots of violence and a lot of like still a good amount of like cutting edge like indie indie style wrestling if you like that. So that's probably the best thumbs up I can give to GCW is that if you are a fan of any kind of modern wrestling, you'll probably get some of it on a GCW show. And it's interesting to see guys who are in in a case of Moxley, a millionaire who is on national television every week in front of a million people uh, for fun, roll around in barbed wire and get glass light tubes broken over his head like that's kind of fascinating to me so a good time i thought well that's good <clears throat> that's good that's good that's good and i don't think it's a product for me that's fine <laughs> yeah i mean i would be lying if i said i completely un like it's not like i watched that i'm like i want to see an entire death match promotion now or Or, or even as I've said, this this variety that they have on the show, I probably still won't probably won't purchase the next GCW show until they have another card like the one last night, where I'm interested enough in one or two of the matches that I want to buy it. So, I don't think I'm a, a regular uh, GCW viewer just yet, but there's there's fun and it is interesting because they do have a lot of it feels like they have a lot of buzz and they part part of the promo of them announcing the Hammerstein Ballroom was uh, Brett Lauderdale, who's the Booker. Uh, talking about how someone he respected in the business and used to look up to told him he's seen a hundred GCWs come and go and that there's nothing special about that place. And I just assumed it's Gabe Sapolsky. He didn't say Gabe (laughs) Sapolsky. I just, I did some math. I did the math. I'm like, who would Brett Lauderdale have talked to that he looked up to as like another wrestling booker that would talk to him that way. It's like, well, he's probably never met Triple H. He's probably never met I don't think Paul Heyman would say that. Yeah. So it's like, it's Gabe. It's almost definitely Gabe. I don't think, I don't think, I mean, Tony Khan, let's go. His guys work on the show. I don't think it would be him. So it's like, yeah, it was probably Gabe, but it's, it's also one of the things where, yes, they are setting records. They're, they set, they've set like four or five attendance records this, this summer alone, which is cool, but it is that thing of they're doing it because they're allowed to use guys from AEW and guys from impact and guys from ROH. So it it had really has formed, I guess, into this like super indie. So it, it, and I don't want to say that like I'm taking away from their success because obviously not all of those guys are on every show that they've been 
setting these records on, but it is one of those things where it's the, the, I think the, there is correlation between their rise in popularity and a bunch of people that were big stars on, on other various wrestling television shows for in some cases, decades uh, coming to their shows like that, that there's some, there's some cause, there's some correlation there. So hopefully they can continue to rise and that they continue to sort of, uh, you know, uplift their homegrown stars while, while allowing those guys to come in. The era we're in, in terms of the Forbidden Door era, is tremendous because no match is impossible. Outside, anyone outside of WWE could wrestle anyone outside of WWE. It's it, that part of it is great. Mm-hmm. But my question has always been what happens the first time a John Moxley or an Eddie Kingston breaks their leg in somebody else's ring and then these guys can't use AEW talent anymore? Yeah, that's that's kind of a, that's a good articulation of, I think, what I was trying to say but couldn't <laughs> find the words for um, is that while you know, obviously they have, they have homegrown stars too, but it's clearly these bigger names that are drawing the extra people and are probably drawing more eyes on, on fight TV as well. And yes, if something were to happen where uh, any one of those doors was suddenly closed, that kind of take your promotions taking a hit and then that could be hard to recover from, you know, ring of honor knows all too well what it's like when a bunch of your top guys just suddenly are gone so yeah i mean and they were out they're obviously in a much better spot from a, like a television standpoint than gcw is right now so yeah it's that is a that is the it's it's all great and it's the wild west until something like that were to happen in which case maybe we're we don't hear so much about gcw <laughs> and and we don't know how tony khan's gonna react right it's like maybe right. he'll just like he'll chalk it up. But it's like it's very easy to be magnanimous and uh, let everybody let all your guys and girls work everywhere, everywhere they want. But nobody's mm-hmm. gotten seriously hurt yet. <laughs> and it's just no. like, obviously I'm not rooting for that. I like seeing dream matches. It's mm-hmm. just like I have always wondered what happens the first time an AEW talent gets hurt working in an AEW show. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, for for gosh sakes, on uh, the show that happened the the day after the one I watched, I mean, Minoru Suzuki's on that show. Yes, you know yes. what? It's like there's there's multiple promotions on multiple continents involved in this. That if there's an injury or or some you know or something like that or or anything sort of bad that could happen that could sour a relationship yeah that's that that would this could change very rapidly so maybe it's more of a hey enjoy it and (laughs) enjoy it while it lasts and fingers crossed we never have to cross that bridge but hey in the meantime it's it's a pretty fun like wild west type indie promotion to watch good times thank you for the review uh g1 is going on in new japan speaking of new japan it's absolutely ruined my life uh jeff cobb and and, uh, kazuchika okada are a top one block and kota ibushi is on top the other block by himself seems like we're headed to okada and cobb on the last day in the one block to decide who goes to face ibushi yeah, I I mean that that makes sense, right? Based on, on I I mean I guess we talked about it I think on the last show they opened the the tournament by having Zack Saber Jr. tap out Shingo and Naito in like back to back nights. Right. So one may have thought that he was getting primed for something, but then as we discussed, that's likely more just because he's gonna uh, wrestle wrestle Shingo in uh, probably like next month's show, right? Right. Right. Yeah. See, yeah, I, I, I guess of the remaining things that they have to do, I guess they have already done Shingo and, and Okada, but it's like, do you just, do you just do that again? I mean, they have four Tokyo Dome shows or whatever. Now, so <laughs> you probably do Shingo versus Okada. You probably do Shingo versus Ibushi. You probably do Shingo versus Naito or something on one of those nights. Like, I don't, I don't know. Like you just, it's one also one of those things where the the more Russell kingdoms that exist, 
the less it feels like the G1 matters because it's like, well, I'm guessing the champion's going to wrestle on all three of those shows. So right. we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. It's, the champ's going to wrestle all, <laughs> on all three of those shows. I'm thinking it's Jeff Cobb one of the nights. And then they got to do some kind of uh, angle to get somebody else in there. Excuse me. On another of the nights and then hopefully Naito is back and Naito and Shingo wrestle also one of the nights I don't think it matters the order that you do it in it's just like the thing where you need a second main event um, oh they could do Shingo and Osprey one of the nights if Osprey can get into the country oh. like clearly yeah, they're that guy yeah clearly they seem to want to do that match uh, and those two are, are it's very strange to me that those two guys are going to end up like big career rivals. <laughs> it's just mm-hmm. like they don't quite seem like they're from the same generation even, but uh, they kill it every time they're in the ring together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Shing- I mean, Shingo has been around a real long time, which I think is <laughs> yes. one of the reasons I think it's cool. Pro- especially maybe if you are a really long time fan of, of uh you know of, of japanese wrestling and you've watched this guy's entire career but he was kind of a journeyman for a long time before he and then he was still kind of a, a middle of the card and then he's a junior for a long time in new japan and then sort of out of necessity they made him a heavyweight and then out of further necessity when osprey left the country <laughs> they had to, they put the belt on him um so it's it's a he's had a very bizarre and winding road and then yes of all people to sort of end up as his rival uh, you know his career rival it is you know it's not sonata or somebody like that or or even a a abushi or somebody it's it's this guy that's hasn't been around nearly as long but as i guess i guess osprey's had a similar career in that he was killing it as a junior heavyweight for years and years and then they didn't really seem to want to go to the next level with him until they had no choice so There's been a lot of bad New Japan this year and a lot of bad New Japan booking this year, but they've done an excellent job with Jeff Cobb. Agreed. Like that is, and we've talked, we talked about this one. I think he's taken positive steps in like the 15th year of his career. (laughs) Yes. Like suddenly, like, I think he's a way more engaging television presence. You have a good angle on it. I've seen, I've I've been reading your reports and stuff that they're also smart of how much Jeff Cobb we see. Yes. Like both in the tag matches and how long his single matches go. Nothing ever goes more than 15 minutes, except his, one of his matches with Okada went like 20. But aside from that, Mm -hmm. they know what he can do. They know you don't want to see him out there huffing and puffing doing a 25 minute match. <laughs> so they keep everything under 15 and he doesn't sell a whole lot. And all he does is stuff that he's good at. And it it's great. How about that? How about what a novel concept to just like take what a guy is good at and let him do that and yeah. not asking him to do stuff he can't do. Yeah. So there clearly are still people that work for that company that are not stupid, which somehow does not explain Chase Owens beating Hiroshi Tanahashi clean in the middle of the ring on a G1 show, which happened this past week. You know, all due respect to Hangman Page being the Joker and winning the ladder match, but reading that Chase Owens pinned Tanahashi clean made me the Joker (laughs) this week. Um, That's one I could not, could not wrap my head around. Uh, I guess is the idea, and I think this is something else that you alluded to in your report, but it's like, they think, well, Tanahashi's the U.S. champion, so we have to constantly be setting up Americans for him to wrestle. Yes, that's how they view the U.S. title, yes. Still dumb. <laughs> Still very dumb. No, man, um, I want to see Tanahashi wrestle like Ishii. <laughs> for yeah, the, for the U.S. Awesome. title. <laughs> I want to see him come over here and wrestle friggin' Rocky Romero for the U.S. title. I don't care. I don't it even, doesn't even have to Dickinson be would probably kill it like any of those New Japan strong guys. Sure. <laughs> any anybody but Chase Owens. <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't I don't understand. Other than that's the that's the only logical strain I can follow out of it is well Chase Owens is originally from the United States <laughs> and 
Hiroshi Tanahashi is the United States champion. But I thought like they figured this out because if you remember those first couple of US shows they ran where Billy Gunn was wrestling in the main event of one of the shows and right. I think they did Okada versus Cody on one of those shows. Yeah. And like, I thought they learned the lesson of like, no, if people are coming to a new Japan show, they're the American new Japan fans want to see new Japan. They want to see the top guys in that company wrestle each other. We don't want to see <laughs> this, you know, Oh, right. well, he's a, schl- he's a slub opening match ta- tag guy, but he's from the U S so we care. Like I thought we solved this problem like years ago, <laughs> But right, we're back. Last, the last, you know, the biggest, the second biggest show they ran here was at the basketball arena in Dallas, and they headlined with Okada and Tanahashi. And we thought, well, right. if they figured it out, but no, mm-hmm. they're running, so they're running San Jose or whatever in November. And I expect Tanahashi to, to be defending against Chase Owens on that show. <laughs> Oof. Oof. <laughs> so, sounds really. Okay. <sighs> Tanahashi is a company man. Gosh, is he? Like, <laughs> that guy. That's a guy who needs to learn how to say no. Do the, it, it doesn't work for me, brother. Like, <laughs> oh, 100%. 100%. Look, I know sometimes when you're booking a tournament, uh, like a, a long round robin tournament like that, you're going to have to do some results you don't necessarily want to do. But I wouldn't have pinned the greatest wrestler of his generation clean in the middle of the ring with a opening match tag guy. Yeah, like I don't know. Like I like I'd set up him and Yano. Like there's so many matches I would do. <laughs> and so many people I would have uh beat if you're if you're like, well, somebody needs to beat Tanahashi clean right. to set up a, a US title match. I'm like, great. Let me see the list of guys. It cannot possibly come down to Chase Owens. There has to be someone else that we can send to America in November <laughs> yeah. to wrestle Tanahashi on that show. <sighs> All right. Well, we've uh, covered the world, the globe. Um, is there anything else you want to discuss? No, I think that uh, that about covers the uh, the big stuff here and abroad, as they say. All right. So till next time, everybody, I'm Ethan. And I'm Liam. We'll be back soon with more stories from the wrestling life. Adios. When you get Thanks for listening. Don't forget to leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Now, here are this week's bonus features. The, the lady didn't yell at me to tell me we were recording that. So. I, I just... Not do just not doing very well today. Okay, I didn't just I didn't want to get fifteen minutes in. Yeah, and... good good call, good call. All right, I swear, <laughs> as you were, unbelievable. <sighs> Maybe I just need to drink a little bit more of this energy drink. <laughs> What is it? Is it co- are you out of Coke energy yet? Have you drank the entire state of Maryland's remaining supplies at this no, point? Not yet. Not yet. Surprisingly, um, I've pivoted. Uh, I am still drinking Coke energy, but I've pivoted all to allow the cherry flavor also, mm. which I previously dismissed as tasting like cough syrup. Um, however, um. I think it's still better than pretty much every other energy drink, even if it's a little more uh, cough droppy. So uh, working on working on Coke Energy Cherry right now. (laughs) Is that one like so are you able to get more of this or did you just like stock up? Stock up. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Um. Yeah, and it's like all the expiration dates and everything are are good so far. Mm -hmm. So we'll find out, you know, in another three or four months. Eventually, you might have to start importing it. Yes, is is the end game here. (laughs) There's going to be some trafficking involved of of Coke energy. (laughs) 
Yes. Uh, yeah, my brother's trafficking coke. <laughs> Energy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, beautiful. Beautiful. <sighs> I've been watching a lot of uh, Alan Coulter clips because I, yeah. I didn't realize when you sent me the one that he had died. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So then I was just like, <laughs> and then I, I, I was, there's the bit where he does the celebrity interview. I had yeah. never seen that before. Yeah. It's where, and it's just always that it was whoever <laughs> Dave's first guest was, was supposed to be his interview. <laughs> and then he just calls Dave names and then yes. storms off dramatically. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's funny every time. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Watch like 10 of them. It was great every time. <laughs> yep. Yep. The great Alan Coulter. He did the um he did the audience uh warm up when we went to see Letterman's show. Oh. Uh, yeah. I didn't re- I didn't realize that was like in his job description, but neither did I. They had another they had another uh like warm up comedian for mm-hmm. many 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 years and I don't know what happened. I don't know if he was just on that day or whatever, but Alan Coulter did the <laughs> did the audience. That's awesome. Him. Yeah. He was great. He was absolutely great. <laughs> just one of those guys who just could com- would just commit to it. Like there's no winking at it when he's doing his shtick like correct. <laughs> Like, which I think makes it better. It's it's the Adam West Batman style of comedy where if you wink at it, it would be less funny. So it's yes. better if he just goes full bore into it. Yes, a thousand percent. A thousand percent. I try to keep on keeping on. 